the inside the earth. Welcome to The Internet Says It's True, a show where we learn something new every week, part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name is Michael Kent. Thank you so much for listening. Every week, I ask my listeners to give me a topic, something from history that sounds made up but is actually true. And this week, we got a good one. You've heard of flat earthers. Well, today, we're talking about hollow earth theory. Different idea, same wacky thinking. Hey, if you have something you've learned, maybe it's a weird story you saw on the internet or something you heard a friend say, send it in. I'd love to do an episode about your topic. You can do that through a simple form on the internet says it's true.com. Right there on the left sidebar, there's an easy place to submit your idea. And if it works for the show, I'll do an episode on it. This week's episode is a good example. This one came from my friend Mark. Hey, Mike, this is Mark from Sims Township, Ohio. I heard a story about John Cleve Sims and his hollow earth theory. I thought it was interesting and thought you should look it up. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. This is an idea that Mark had submitted to me quite a while ago, and I hung on to it because I wanted to learn about it. It's also somewhat of a local story because Sims is buried here in Ohio. If you visit Hamilton, Ohio, just north of Cincinnati, there's a city park with a strange feature. In the center of the park, a small fenced-off area contains an obelisk grave marker for John Cleves Sims Jr., On top of the obelisk is a sphere with a hole going through the center. It was a final gesture of recognition to a theory he spent his whole life promoting. The grave used to be surrounded by all the graves of Hamilton area residents. The city park was once a cemetery, but when the graves were moved in 1848 to make room for a park, Sims' grave stayed behind as the only reminder of the cemetery. After all, he had owned the land and the sphere on top of the monument was put there by his son. It represents the earth with a big hole going through it, a simplified representation of what he believed, which was super weird. I'll describe to you his theory the way he described it to the world in June of 1818, when he placed the same announcement in hundreds of newspapers worldwide. It says, quote, To all the world, I declare the earth is hollow, and habitable within, containing a number of concentric spheres, one within the other, and that it is open at the poles 12 or 16 degrees. I pledge my life in support of this truth and am ready to explore the hollow, if the world will support and aid me in the undertaking. John Cleves Sims of Ohio, late captain of infantry. NB, which means note de bene, it's like, it's like P.S., I have ready for the press a treatise on the principles of matter wherein I show proof of the above positions, account for various phenomena, and dispose Dr. Darwin's golden secret, end quote. Now he goes on to ask for 100 brave companions and says they'll start in Siberia in the fall on their expedition and expect to find vegetables, animals, and possibly men living inside the hole that they discover on top of the earth. But I was really curious about this Dr. Darwin's golden secret he mentions. In 1818, Charles Darwin was only nine years old, so no one knew who Charles Darwin was. So what was he talking about? Apparently, this is a reference to Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, who was a famed botanist and philosopher. In one of Erasmus's poems, he claims that there's an undiscovered secret that causes the directions of the winds on the earth to change. So when Sims claims to dispose Dr. Darwin's golden secret, he's saying that discovering the hole in the top and bottom of the earth may explain why the winds change. So who was John Cleves Sims Jr.? He was born in 1718, and his uncle was a more well-known man with the same name. He was named after his famous uncle, John Cleve Sims, who was a famous pioneer and father-in-law to President William Henry Harrison. So you'll often see the Sims we're talking about with Junior after his name, or his military rank, so people wouldn't confuse him. He was a captain in the 1st Infantry Regiment and was in the service during the War of 1812 where he was involved in the Siege of Fort Erie and the Battle of Lundy's Lane. After the Army, he became a merchant in St. Louis, trading with Native Americans there and then moved to Newport, Kentucky, which is just across the river from downtown Cincinnati, and then later Hamilton, Ohio. This was around the time he decided to dedicate the entire rest of his life to promoting this hollow earth theory. 
The circular that he placed in newspapers in 1818, the one I just read to you, explains what he believed, that the Earth is made up of concentric hollow spheres with a hole at the top and the bottom, and that inside the Earth is habitable. And he didn't make it up by himself. This was an idea that had existed for at least 150 years, going back to the late 17th century. An English astronomer, Edmund Halley, and if Halley sounds familiar, yes, that's the Halley's Comet guy, had written in 1692 that the Earth's outer shell was 500 miles thick, and inside that there was another sphere that turned on its own magnetic poles separate from the outer sphere, and inside that another shell, and so on. Apparently this was his way to explain why he would sometimes get strange magnetic compass readings that would change. He also came up with this idea that the inside was habitable and that when we see Aurora Borealis, the northern lights, that's caused by escaping gas from inside the hollow earth. John Cleves Sims had also read Cotton Mather's book, The Christian Philosopher, which argued that God wouldn't have wanted the earth to have any wasted space, so an inhabitable hollow earth made sense. John Cleves Sims Jr. wasn't a trained scientist. He just loved to read and was fascinated with this theory, so much so that in addition to placing his message in newspapers, he created 500 copies of a pamphlet that explained his theory, and he sent it to politicians, scientists, and anyone all over the world, important people that he thought would listen. Along with the pamphlet, he attached the results of a mental exam to prove he wasn't crazy. One of the people who received the Sims pamphlet was an American president who was rumored not only to have believed him, but was willing to support his expedition to the top of the world. And I'll tell you more about that after a quick break. It's been colder lately, and I have photos on my Instagram of me wearing one of my favorite clothing items for this time of year, my Scotty Vest fleece. It is awesome for traveling around because it has pockets for all of my gadgets, for my phone, my glasses, my wallet, my charging cord, you name it. It's a clothing company I believe in, and I'm confident that they've got an article of clothing that you'll love. The best thing you can do is take a look at all the awesome pocket-packed clothing on their website. Go to scottyvest.com and enter promo code TM15, that's Tango Mike 15, and you'll get 15% off your order. The link is in my show notes. I love a good old-fashioned, quality bourbon, natural ingredients. When it's done right, it's just perfect. Well, I found this company in Booze. They make natural ingredient cocktail infusions with fruits, herbs, and spices that help you create a drink at home with your favorite alcohol out of ingredients that you know and trust. It's actually a pretty easy process, too. You just buy a kit from InBooze, whether it's the red wine sangria infusion or the spicy margarita. Then you add the infusion to your own alcohol, and then you let it sit. You let it infuse for three days. Then you're ready to party with a natural flavor, amazing tasting cocktail. You can also find recipes for mocktails if you're not an alcohol drinker. Go check out all the infusions they have to offer at inbooze.com. That's I-N-B-O-O-Z-E dot com. And let them know I sent you. I've also put the link on my deals page on my website. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing bombs, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. Let's get back to the story. There's this awesome headline that I've seen several places around the internet. It goes like this. President John Quincy Adams approved a mission to Earth's interior to meet the mole people that live within. Here's what we know. President Adams was a strong supporter of exploration. He loved science and scientific discoveries. Adams was up for re-election soon and needed the country to know that he was in favor of exploration and decisiveness. That had been one of the criticisms by his opponent, Andrew Jackson, who people saw as bold and decisive. And one of Sims' students and protégés, Jeremiah Reynolds, did get approval by President Adams to lead an exploration. 
Reynolds was a newspaper editor who was so enamored by the hollow earth theory that he had quit his job and began following Sims around to his speeches throughout the country. President Adams knew that Reynolds was a follower of Sims and knew what Sims believed. But this is where most of the theory sort of falls apart. There isn't any actual proof that John Quincy Adams believed in hollow earth or mole people living inside. According to Howard Dorr at Plotting Through the Presidents, the reason people think that is because Adams said that Sims' theory was, quote, visionary. Well, the way people used the word visionary back then was different than they do now. They would have used that word to mean having a fanatical or even disturbed imagination. Not how we use it now, which means like, you know, ahead of his time and really forward thinking. And in fact, Adams didn't support this expedition until after Reynolds had disavowed and abandoned the hollow earth theory in favor of a more scientifically grounded polar expedition. But Andrew Jackson beat John Quincy Adams and the expedition never happened, so none of that matters anyway. But if you want to hear more about this particular little story, go listen to episode 5 of the Plotting Through the President's podcast, John Quincy Adams vs. the Internet, and you'll hear that sort of side story. Toward the end of the Adams presidency, Sims' theories were rising in popularity, but the man himself was getting old and falling ill. This is why it would be up to one of his disciples, Reynolds, to carry on with plans for a polar expedition. When John Cleve Sims died in May of 1829, his theories would never gain more popularity than when he was alive. His son Americus, along with some of his ardent followers, had tried to continue his message, but without scientific proof there was no widespread support. An expedition to the North Pole wouldn't even be completed until the early 1900s. Despite his failure at convincing the world of his theories, there are a few lasting legacies from Sims. Some credit his hollow earth theory with giving a rise to the subterranean genre of science fiction. Jules Verne's popular 1864 book, Journey to the Center of the Earth, was a huge hit and a springboard for science fiction, but 40 years prior to that, Nathaniel Ames anonymously published a similar themed book called Voyage of Discovery where characters traveled into the center of the hollow earth to discover animals and subterranean people. Another lasting legacy is his very strange grave marker sitting inside Sims Park and Playground in Hamilton, Ohio. You can still see it to this day. And on the north side of the marker are the following words, immortalizing his effort to contribute to science. Captain John Cleve Sims was a philosopher and originator of Sims' theory of concentric spheres and polar voids. He contended that the earth is hollow and habitable within. Now, if this story occurred in 2022, you'd be hearing John Cleve Sims Jr. being treated as a credible scientist on the Joe Rogan podcast. But since it happened in the 19th century, this theory has been left exactly where it belongs, in the trash heap of junk science. Now it's time for the part of the podcast where I call a friend, and today I am calling someone who you know very well if you listen to this show, my good friend Eric Dittleman. Eric is an accomplished mind reader. He's been seen on everything from America's Got Talent to Ellen to Live with Kelly and Ryan. Like I said, he's quite a podcast regular, and I keep inviting him back because he's so much fun. What's up, Eric? Good to see you again. Hey, Michael. How are you? I'm good. Thanks good. for having me. We just had you on a few weeks ago for the hot air balloons over France, I believe. Was that the one you were on for? Yeah. And if you're listening out of order, spoiler alert. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't. It's in the description of the episode. I think we're. Oh, I think it's go. actually the title of the episode, a hot air balloon <laughs> duel. That's um, right. But it's good to have you back. How's your week been? Oh, good. I mean, we just got hit by a huge blizzard here in uh, New York, so that affected yeah. some shows and some gigs, but uh, we rally and reschedule and do all the things we need to do. That's good. So do you are you well stocked? You don't have to get out and, and trek through the snow to the local, I don't know what you do, bodega in New York <laughs> City? No, I'll still order delivery, just up that tip fee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> remove a little bit of guilt that way. <laughs> 
Well, uh, this is a fun topic this week. Um, I almost, we were talking on the phone and I almost gave it up to you the other day and told you about the topic because I wanted to talk about it. But then you're like, no, don't tell me because I might be on the show this week. And so I was like, okay, okay, here we go. Yeah. So keep it fresh. The way we've been doing this for question one lately is playing for a joke. So if mm-hmm. you get it right, I'll tell you a joke. If you get it wrong, you'll tell me one. Here is question number one John Cleves Sims Jr was a man who spent much of his life in the 1800s lecturing and writing to promote what theory around the world? Was it A. Photographs capture human souls B. The theory of relativity or C. Hollow Earth theory Um, Relativity sounds too normal for your podcast. I feel like maybe it's got to be the photograph soul or the hollow earth. Um, Hmm. I feel like just my guy. I I have no idea how to base this off of just the name alone. So I'm just going to go with um, hollow earth is my guess. You are correct. That's a great guess. Hollow earth theory. Um, yeah, I put the theory of relativity in there because I thought maybe you'd think that I was trying to trick you because that's Einstein's theory. <laughs> right. And maybe the whole, you thought the whole episode would be like, oh, this other guy invented it or figured it out before Einstein. <laughs> and that was what we were talking about. No, it's about hollow earth. This guy, <laughs> and he didn't make it up. It's a, it's an older thing, but he really made it popular when he was doing this, uh, that the earth is not only hollow, but that it's habitable, inhabitable within so, yeah, um, the the and, and in fact, he thought it was a series of like concentric shells. Right. So there's like earth with a hole in the top and the bottom. And inside that is a earth with a hole in the bottom. And there's animals and vegetables. And I don't know why you you would think this. It's a crazy theory. <laughs> but he made a good living lecturing in his older years and and distributing this pamphlet. And uh, and so the reason that people know about this, the only reason people know about this is there's this really cool myth that John Quincy Adams believed in this guy and Mm -hmm. helped him fund an expedition to go to the hole and to go and discover the mole people. And uh, it turns out it's not that's not true at all. Uh, Is that where we get chuds? What's that? The cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers, that horror movie. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> You've referenced a horror movie I've never heard of. <laughs> but yeah, I would assume that that goes well. Maybe uh, maybe he, this man gave the idea. You know, Journey to the Center of the Earth was pretty much based on this guy's idea. And it, was, it was, wasn't even the first. 40 years before Journey to the Center of the Earth, there was another book. That was about going underworld and finding these underground people that lived in there. So, all right. So you got it right. I have to tell you a joke. And I'm really happy about this one because I wanted to tell it last week. But uh, (laughs) Judson missed the question, so I didn't get to tell it. Here it is. What's the difference between a well-dressed man on a unicycle and a poorly dressed man on a bike? Hmm. I don't know. A tire. Uh, come on uh, come on it works both ways it does <laughs> it does that's a double or double joke that almost be a good riddle for for diddle me this yeah uh, maybe not <laughs> <laughs> my rule for riddles is it can't be like popsicle stick jokes yeah because it really <laughs> is that real that really is one yeah <laughs> I got last week, the last one I listened to, it was two weeks ago. You do. So for if you're listening and you don't know what we're talking about on uh, Mind Over Magic, which is Eric Diddleman's podcast with Matt Franco, there is a, a segment uh, that is that is a a riddle, but like a yeah. hard riddle. And it's called Diddle Me This. Depends and, if on the episode if it's a hard riddle or not. <laughs> yeah. Some of them. I mean, usually they're pretty difficult because you're in dis- you're so many episodes in that. You know, yeah. generally the finding t- the- riddles is tough. <laughs> I bet. I bet. What was the one we listened to? Um, oh, gosh. Now I don't remember. Oh, it was a, a car that went from like the East Coast to the West Coast. Uh, and it was and the guy uh, it was on like a flatbed truck or something was my guess. I'm uh, trying to even remember what this it was. The, was. <laughs> so the guy. Oh, no, I remember what it was now. The uh, OK, here it was. Oh, a, the car a, a traveled woman drove the, uh, from, from Chicago to San Francisco in three days and found that her tire was flat. Yes. Yeah. And it was. And well, how did she make it to San Francisco is the riddle. 
Yeah. This is bonus content right now. It is bonus content. Uh, and that if you're you, taking from my podcast. Well, yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about magic in Las Vegas for a little while? No, that's okay. okay. We're good. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> go go listen to that episode. It's like two episodes ago, and you can hear um, all of the cool guesses of stuff that they come up with trying to solve that riddle, or that Matt comes up with. Question episode two. Episode 81. There you go. Episode <laughs> you 81 go. of Mind Over Magic. Uh, for the next question, we're playing for a Facebook post in which we use the phrase, cool beans. Oh, that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> I could but do that. But like, is that something you would say in everyday conversation, maybe? No, but I feel like my online social media audience would not be see anything's amiss if I posted that. I don't know if mine would or not. It's not something I would say. Oh, and you can't be like all meta with it. You can't be like, I hate when people say cool beans. Like you can't. There's not that's skirting the the rule. Do you have to use it in its sense, or can yes. you be like, oh, these are um, some cool beans. <laughs> like I gotta warm up my pintos because they're cool beans. Uh, <laughs> no, you have to use it in the colloquial sense of that's awesome. Slash. Why did cool I go beans. with pinto beans? I don't know. They must. <laughs> when I think of cold beans, the pinto is the first one I go to. Garbanzos, I think of as very hot. So, I don't know if that's true. Garbanzo beans are just lentils, right? I don't know. There's the, well, welcome, welcome to the bean cast. <laughs> welcome to bean chat. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. <laughs> if you get this one wrong, I'll say cool beans in a Facebook post. Um, another often disproven theory about the nature of the earth is, of course, flat earth theory. Mm-hmm. Which one of these celebrities is a confirmed flat earther? Okay. A, Brooklyn point guard Kyrie Irving, B, mm-hmm. music star MC Hammer, or C, comedian Chevy Chase? I'm sure they all are at some point, but <laughs> <laughs> in their own way. Famously, uh, you know, I have to go with former Celtics, I believe, uh, Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving, you are correct. It is Kyrie Irving. Um, I found a list of famous flat earthers, and there were a lot of them on there. Um, I didn't want to choose all musicians, but there are a lot of musicians. And um, Shaquille O'Neal was once labeled as a flat earther, but uh, he has since gone back and said he was just trolling when he said that. So I couldn't include him because we're we're still not sure. But yeah, this is um, in February 2017. Irving stated in an interview for a podcast that he believes the earth is flat in a later interview. He was less forceful in advancing his flat earth belief, encouraging people to, quote, do their own research into the topic. Amazing. I love that these ball players are like flat earthers because they literally hold a ball shaped item as their career. And they're like, nope, not possible for the earth. Trust me. I know what a ball feels like. This earth don't feel like balls. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I might have to bleep that sentence out. Um (laughs) If this was your podcast, that would be the title of the show is This Earth Don't Feel Like Balls. That's correct. (laughs) We just pick a random line. (laughs) It's always good. Question three. You're two for two, by the way. Uh, Thank you. For this question, we're playing for a coveted The Internet Says It's True sticker. Uh, How many do you owe me by now? uh, At least four. (laughs) At least four. Probably all the ones I have left in this this bag. Um, But I do owe you a few. Uh, I have sent you zero. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Maybe I'll get this the... one wrong on purpose so I don't keep adding it to the tally. Yeah, just add it to my tab of stickers I owe you. You're going to be able to cover like your road case with this thing. <laughs> All right. For this question, uh, you're a mentalist. You don't have a road case. No, I don't. <laughs> for this question, we'll be relying upon your well-proven skills and estimation. Oh, boy. <laughs> of I'm course. famously bad at estimating. Go on. We, we know the earth is solid and made up of the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. My question to you is, how deep into the earth have we dug? So, via, and I, I intentionally use the word dug there. This is man-made, like, drilling. How, how deep into the earth have we dug? Is it A, 40,230 feet, B, 10,110 feet, or C, 600 feet? 
Oh boy. Oh no. Uh, um, I was hoping you were going to ask me the layers of the earth. I do that. <laughs> I don't even have a reference point of how deep the crust goes, but I feel like we have not cracked through the crust. That seems like it would be problematic. Uh, let's see, maybe. What was the first two? The first two. Uh, A was 40,230, mm-hmm. B, 10,110. I'm going to go with whatever the largest one is. 40,230? Yeah. You are correct. That is it. (laughs) A wonderful guess. You are three for three. Uh, This is from a BBC article. Quote, the Kola, K-O-L-A, super deep borehole, the deepest man-made hole on Earth and deepest artificial point on Earth. It's uh, it's 40,230 feet deep. It's so deep that locals swear, this is a quote from the BBC, locals swear you can hear the screams of souls tortured in hell. Um, Like, yeah, like BBC got all artistic on that sentence. It took the Soviets almost 20 years to drill this far, but the drill bit was still only about one third of the way through the crust to the Earth's mantle when the project came grinding to a halt in the chaos of post-Soviet Russia. And just for reference... That distance, 40,230 feet, is just over six miles, about the same distance from Brooklyn to Central Park. Wow. So since you said you already might have to bleep a previous sentence, you might now have to also bleep the word borehole. (laughs) The super deep borehole. Uh, Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. (laughs) You're three for three, man. You're killing it. Question four. For this question, we're playing for 72 million internet points. Oh, that to be received up. over the course of your lifetime or a lump sum of 42 million internet points. So oh, 72 okay. spread out or 42 all at once up to you. An ancient Judeo-Christian view of the structure that the world's uh, of the world sees all of the sky and stars as sort of being inside a sphere where the sky is the dome with a flat earth across the bottom and pillars of the earth below. What is the term for this? Is it a the geocentric model? B, the firmament, or C, the primordial sphere? Oh, I feel like I watched a documentary and should know this. Uh, Geocentric model is, I believe, just the Galileo way of looking at the world and the solar system. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. That's totally wrong. (laughs) Um, Geocentric means Earth is the center of the... Oh, boy. Uh, I'm getting confused now. I've never heard of firmament, was it? (sighs) Firmament was B. And what was C? Primordial sphere. Mm, That seems wrong, too. All of these sound wrong. (laughs) These are wrong. That's not how the world works. (laughs) How can you have a right answer when it's all wrong? Um... I'm going to, uh, uh, I don't know, firmament sounds funny. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> oh, my God. You got another one right with a complete guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, this one is an early Hebrew conception of the cosmos. Um, so it, it's the, the Judeo-Christian belief ge- generally talks about firmament as like imagine a snow globe. That's sort of what what firmament would be. And I can't believe that you've gotten all these questions right with pure guesses. It's you're killing it right now. Um, (laughs) And you're four for five, which is incredible. Uh, But real quick, I want to give another plug for your podcast, which is, which is mind over magic. It's available. Are you going to pull it from Spotify until Joe Rogan leaves Spotify? I don't even know if we're on Spotify. We probably are. I don't know. I just I just put it up and wherever it gets to on whatever platform. Wherever wherever you listen to podcasts, as they yes, say. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Mind Over Magic. It's me and Vegas headliner Matt Franco talking about uh, magic and mind reading in Vegas and in New York. And we talk about our experiences on America's Got Talent and just other general things about performing uh in productivity and entertainment in general plus we, as michael said we have riddles and trivia as well so i love the trivia trivia is my favorite and as someone who loves trivia i never go and like go out to play trivia oh i'm a big pub trivia person which i've been missing terribly yeah. during the cold weather and uh you know all these you know 
pandemic stuff going on. One of my favorite things to do when I'm traveling by myself is to eat at Buffalo Wild Wings and sit at the bar by myself and play trivia on the TV. I, <laughs> there is something very comforting about it. It I don't know why. It's just like a nice... Mm -hmm. It was nicer when I was younger and I could eat at 10 p.m. after shows. Now I don't necessarily get to do that as much anymore because if I eat after 10 p.m., tomorrow's going to suck, basically. That's mm. just the way <laughs> my body works at 43. Uh, but in any case, yeah, that... Uh, I, why do we, well, we were talking about trivia. I was like, why are we talking about food right now? Do you, um, do you play along with Jeopardy? I do, yeah. And yeah, um, I... I do pretty well at Jeopardy. I'm better at linguistic games. I'm better at Wheel of Fortune than I am at Jeopardy. Mm -hmm. But Jeopardy is okay. It, it depends on the category, obviously. But um, I tried out for Jeopardy in college. No way. For the yeah. college version or for the real deal? For the college version. I mean, the college yeah. version is the real deal. But Right, right. Uh, and they bring you in and they do like a, a test. And what they don't tell you is how many you get right or wrong. There's apparently like a certain level of questions you got to get right. So I was not selected. So I just tell people I missed it by one. Yeah. Who knows? That's, Maybe I did. Yeah. With the information that you have, yeah. you could deduce that you missed it by one. But I got a water bottle and a pen. So it was all worth cool. it. Yeah. yeah, I would like to to try out for Jeopardy. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, but it just seems to me like a ton of pressure. Like that yeah. of as game shows go, that one would be the most pressure that you'd feel. Mm -hmm. I think. Maybe when Millionaire was a thing, that one would be a lot of pressure, but you gotta work the buzzer though. That's the key to doing well on Jeopardy. Because uh, everyone guess, knows did, 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 the did, 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 questions did, did, did. usually. Yeah. So just being able to buzz in All right, at I'm, the right time. Okay, I'm gonna do a test of how how fast I can tap. Like I would on the buzzer on my microphone. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So he asks the question and then, oh, hang on. Hang on. I got to Here we go. Ready? Go. See, it's not even about the speed. It's, not tapping. it's all about. So there's a light that shine that, that pops up once the question is finished reading. And you just have to be the first once that light becomes activated. You almost have to anticipate it because if you're too early, it locks you out. Yeah. So it's all about and the that's, timing. And that's after you've decided if you can answer or not. Right. I you think know. usually the contestants at that stage kind of all pretty much know the answers for almost everything or that's, try to. That's incredible. That and just then it's alone. just about beating everyone else. Because I think the average person watches the show and knows, you know, maybe 20 to 30 percent of the questions. Uh, so that's that's really impressive. All right. So we're down to question five. You've, you're four for four so far. And this last question is for all the marbles. If you get it wrong. You're banned from the show, and I'm revoking all of the stickers you've won from previous shows. Wow. You'll never be asked on again, and I will delete you from my phone. Oh, this is really intense. <laughs> I just got to stack the odds to make this. You know, if I had millionaire music, the, the lights would come up. It would be like, do 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 <laughs> You are an avid visitor of escape rooms, and yes. I'm positive you've done more of them than anyone that I know. Your question is this. What makes a great escape room? Oh, um, well, at where we're at with escape rooms now, it's just the novelty of like new sorts of puzzles and making sure that the um, the puzzles and the locks of where you kind of have to solve things are now kind of more immersive in the theme of the room because there's nothing like worse than like some sort of weird anachronism where you're supposed to be in a forest and then you got all these random locks that seem out of place. Yeah, um, total immersion. Then, and then also um, red herrings are the death of a room for me. If there's too many like or any red herrings, every every clue and riddle should actually kind of lead like um, to that inevitable surprise of where it's supposed to end up. So yes. once you solve it, it'd be like, aha, I should have seen it all along. Uh, so I think those are the, the, the most fun um, kind of rooms for me in terms of puzzle design. Well, that is a correct answer. So wonderful. And since you went five for five, you get this special sound. You did it. Congratulations. Yay, you did it. Uh, <laughs> thanks again for, for joining me, man. I, you know, I've never, I've done one escape room in my life mm. in Wapakoneta, Ohio, home of Neil Armstrong. Was it escaping the pronunciation of that town? <laughs> yeah, that's basically <laughs> all you had to do was be able to say Wapakoneta and put the right em emphasis, and then they just let you out. 
Um, amazing. What, what's amazing is that people that grow up in Wapakoneta cannot escape Wapakoneta. So that's the that's the real <laughs> escape room is the city itself. I I did um we, we we would have done okay except the combination lock for the final clue uh, got changed and oh. malfunctioned. <laughs> and there was yeah. a, a host watching like there to help us if we needed it, I guess. And she saw it happening and she's like, oh, they know what's what to do. They're just not working. So then she like just told us the clue that was in the lock. She couldn't even <laughs> open it. It was a combination lock and somehow it got changed without anyone knowing. So not only were we not able to solve it, anyone that came after us probably wouldn't be able to either. So it was bad. It was a that's, bad, bad that, escape room. That's when you get the bolt cutters, which we actually had to do in one of the rooms we did where we're like, that you sounds really expensive. want us to break through the lock? That's awesome. Right. Every group that pays, they they have to buy a new lock? Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's commitment. <laughs> I, I will um do more. I want to do a, like a professional good one somewhere where that's how they make their money year round. Um, yeah, I need to. Me and my friends, we went and just uh, this past week uh, did seven in a day. <laughs> that is wow, seven. Yeah. Do, you, do you get your clues mixed up between escape rooms? Oh no, no, no! Okay. You, it's a good reset in between. Okay, you're solving yeah. the room at hand. <laughs> yeah, I've got one. It's kind of like an escape room for Oculus. It's a no, an Oculus game that feels very escape roomish. It's a mm. lot of fun. But it's difficult. Yeah. So. Cool, man. Well, go find Eric Diddleman online. Uh, he's E. Diddleman on Twitter. And uh, is Instagram E. Diddleman as well? Or Eric Diddleman? All of my socials are E. Diddleman, D-I-T-T-E-L-M-A-N. And you can also visit my website if you want to book me for gigs, uh, www.ericdiddleman.com. Awesome, man. Have a great week. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Well, that is all for this week. Next week will be a completely different topic, so send those topics in on our website. Thanks to Mark for this week's topic and to Eric Diddleman for being my guest. Here's the voice of one of the mole people. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. Don't forget to join up on Patreon if you want to see the unedited video of the guest appearance or to hear bonus episodes. You can do that at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Also, if you learned something that you didn't already know from the show, please visit iTunes and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That's the rule. You gotta do it. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works to get the podcast suggested to more people. And that way we can keep learning something new if the internet says it's true. The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Catherine Morgan, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Matt McVeigh, Jim Martin, Joanne Martin, and the show's official Emperor Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and additional music this week was from Cooper Cannell. All audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. 